There's still time for others to declare their interest, but it's looking like one of these MSPs will succeed Nicola Sturgeon. From the left, Hamza Youssef, Ash Regan and Kate Forbes are so far those in the running to be SNP leader and with it, Scotland's likely next First Minister. The winner among party members would still need to be formally voted in to the role by MSPs. Well, Miss Forbes is the latest to enter the contest. She's 32 years old and is in Miss Sturgeon's cabinet just now as finance secretary, although she has been on maternity leave since last summer. That meant she didn't have to vote on gender reforms that have divided her party, reforms which she she told the BBC today she wouldn't have voted for. Ash Reagan is the former Community Safety Minister, but she quit her government post in December so she could vote against that gender reform legislation. She's 48 years old and has been in the Scottish Parliament since 2016 when she was first elected as MSP for Edinburgh Eastern. And Hamza Youssef, perhaps the best known of the three, having been Nicola Sturgeon's health secretary for nearly two years. He was just a secretary before that and has been in various ministerial roles since way back in 2012. And despite all that experience, at the heart of government, he's still just 37 years old. At his campaign launch this morning, Hamza Youssef promised to focus on the policies of independence, not the process. I sat down with him afterwards. Hamza Youssef, thank you so much for joining us for a chat on Pleasure. the Nine. Looking at your record as Health Secretary, first of all, given the crisis that the Scottish NHS is in, a &E waiting times are at a record high this winter, waiting times for operations growing, ambulance response times also at a record high. Are you proud of your record as Health Secretary? Well, I know that the NHS has suffered its biggest shock in 74 years of existence. Uh, these are not unique challenges to Scotland. These are challenges that have been faced by every single health service right across the UK and many of them actually right across the world. Uh, but there are also actually, challenges that people like the BME tell us were there before Covid. The, these I'm challenges certain. were already I don't, there I don't, I don't and they've that. been made worse. I don't dispute that some challenges existed uh, pre-Covid too. But these challenges are shared to suggest that they're one party's fault or one person's fault. Well, the evidence across the UK doesn't show that to be the case. But what is different in Scotland? Well, Scotland's NHS is the only NHS in the entire UK where strike action has been averted. And we are this close to getting a deal done for NHS staff for next financial year, which hasn't even, of course, begun yet. Now, if we do that, then Scotland remains the only part of the UK that has gone through an entire winter without NHS staff going on strike. That's not by accident. That's not a coincidence. It's because I've built up those relationships with trade unions compromised, negotiated, and that's, that's the kind of skills that people want but in their leader. Do you think that will come as any comfort to somebody who's spent an uncomfortable six hours in an ambulance I outside A&E? I think it will come to comfort. You really that, believe that? I think it will come to or comfort somebody for who's people. Or relative I'll tell you, has I'll, died needlessly No, I'll tell you why it will come to comfort, because the situation in the NHS is, of course, extremely challenging. But how much more challenging would it be if we had ambulance drivers on strike? If you had nurses? on strike, it would be phenomenally difficult. And this, these strikes in England and indeed uh, in other parts of the UK, they're not going away. If anything, the strikes are being ramped up because the UK government's refusing to negotiate. What I'm doing is meaningfully engaging. Uh, and by doing that and using those skills, I hope I can reach across the political divide because our political discourse is a bit divided. Let's be honest about it. Uh, and it needs somebody with those leadership qualities and those leadership skills. Well, let's talk about one of the most immediate challenges that mm. you're going to face. What will your course of action be um, for the Gender Recognition Bill? Will, will you continue to challenge the UK government's attempt to block that bill? I don't understand how anybody can think that, in the f that, that, that rolling over, simply caving in and allowing the UK government to use this undemocratic Section 35 order, which will veto a bill, it's but it's exactly the democratic, it's law, the it's the way that the Scottish Parliament was set up think, and the Scotland I, I Act, it's, it's, wholly, a, it's actually a matter of law. It's a matter of law, but I think it's wholly undemocratic and, and, and against the uh, principles of devolution to have a piece of legislation that was passed by a majority of the Parliament, had MSPs from every single party support it, and for a UK government to then veto it on a whim uh, well, and, they vetoed it we because just, it doesn't fit with UK-wide no, applied they, equality laws. Because they don't like it. Uh, so you're making a serious judgment 
that it doesn't fit with the quality law. That, that's I what would, their judgment is. Well, I, I, I would strongly challenge that. And I think if we cave in on that, so we, regardless of whether you support GRR or don't, is the principle of protecting Scotland's democracy. If we cave in now, imagine what kind of message that sends to the UK government, that they can veto any bill at a whim. This so is yes, the first time I, they've done it. Well, exactly that. And if you cave in on the first so in time years they of do it... revolution, it's the first so time. So if you cave in on the first time that they do that, what kind of signal does that send to the UK government? It sends a signal that we're not fight it, we'll not challenge it, and they will do it on bill after bill after bill. I'm not prepared to let them do that. What about the de facto referendum idea? Is that dead in the water now? It's not dead in the water. Uh, look, it's not, it's not uh, an idea that I'm wedded to. The First Minister describes it as her preferred option. It's, uh, I wouldn't describe it. Is it, it yours? No, I wouldn't describe it. I don't, I don't have that preferred option. Um, so I if think, not that, what? Well, that's the point of engaging the membership. Uh, you know, if I go in and prejudge what the membership is going to tell me, I'm not really listening. It's a fait accompli. Uh, I think the point of leadership is to engage, uh, to, to put ideas forward, uh, certainly to listen. Uh, and that's what I would attempt uh, to do. Lots of comments and questions have been raised about faith because, oh, yeah. because mm -hmm. of Kate Forbes' religious views. Is it fair, do you think, in a political uh, battle to scrutinise somebody's faith? I mean, I think it depends. So I'm, I, I'm Muslim. Uh, I don't hide from the fact I'm very, very proud to be Muslim. In a few weeks' time, I'll be fasting during the campaign, which will be uh, a lot of fun. Um, and what I would say is the difference is that my faith, and as strong as my faith is, and I believe uh, and I practice uh, my faith, it's not the basis for legislating for me. And that's why my track record will show you, and we've talked about some of the issues that I support um, and, and, and for issues that are coming up in the future, for example, my support for buffer zones uh, in relation to abortion services. You know, I don't legislate on the basis of faith. I legislate as a representative on the basis of what I think is best for the country. Uh, if somebody else legislates on the basis of faith, then those questions are, are, are for them. But it's not the basis of how I decide law or policy should be made. How committed are you to the SNP's deal with the Greens? Is the green tail wagging the yellow dog, I'm as some have suggested? I'm 100% committed to the deal with the Greens. I think it would be foolish, absolutely foolish, uh, for anybody to try to destabilise that deal. It has provided not just stability, uh, it has also helped us bring forward some radical policies. And in fact, we'll, you know, it's been at a time when we have so much discord in our politics, quite good, I think, to see an example of where collegiate uh, governance uh, has, 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 has again uh, brought benefits to people up and down the country. So I'm, I'm, I'm full square behind uh, the Green Deal and, and very supportive of it indeed. Hamza Youssef, thank you so much for joining us on The Nine. Thank you. Hamza Youssef there speaking to Laura a bit earlier on. Well, let's get to Kate Forbes now, who's been speaking to the BBC's Scotland editor, James Cook, about her independent strategy. She's a member of the Free Church of Scotland, which follows a strict interpretation of the Bible. James also spoke to her about that and her views on gender reform. But first, why does she want to be the next First Minister? Well, I'm running to be leader because I've got the vision, the experience and the competence, not just to inspire the voters within the SNP, but also to inspire voters right across Scotland, who we ultimately want to vote for better days and to vote for independence. Nicola Sturgeon's idea was that if you got 50% of the vote plus one vote in a general election campaign, that that would force your opponents to come to the negotiating table. Is that the right approach or not? I don't think it's as simple as that. When you've got two parties in a discussion here, I think we need to, in Scotland, continue to build the support so that it is unstoppable from Westminster's perspective, because that is what will demonstrate the appetite eh, and the requirement to have a vote. I think that the next election is part of that. I think the next election has to ensure that independence is front and centre and that there is a mandate. But it will be yet another mandate. So the mandates are there and I think it's about maximising that support and ensuring that independence is front and centre. I mean, if, if a voter were to look at the SNP's record now and say that front and centre of Nicola Sturgeon's approach was closing the attainment gap in education, that's miles away from happening. There's an ongoing and really deep crisis in the National Health Service, which I accept is also the case in other parts of the UK. And drug deaths have, have hit record highs, for example. Is that a record of competent governance? Well, we 
need to focus on our priorities and we need to focus on delivery. So you talked about the NHS. We know that the NHS is one of uh, the people of Scotland's priorities and we need to get it right. I have just come back from maternity leave where I've made probably more use of the NHS than I have at any other point in my life. It's an incredible institution that needs to be put on a sustainable footing for the next few decades. And that requires us to think very carefully about prioritising how to improve it, uh, ensuring that we support frontline workers, because ultimately that's what matters. Um, but from an investment perspective, I've obviously been managing Scotland's budget for the last few years. I know the financial challenges that we face. And that means that when we spend our money, we need to make sure that we're getting the right outcomes. So that money that we spend can't get lost in bureaucracy and management. That money has got to go frontline. It's got to go to the nurses and the doctors who care for patients. And I think that requires a huge investment in technology, huge investment in staff, eh, ensuring that you know our nurses are exhausted at the moment. They are across eh, the UK, but they are tired and they are exhausted. So ensuring that they don't feel like they have to leave, that we keep them there. Would you have voted for the Gender Recognition Reform Bill had you been in Parliament on the day? I would have been on record saying that I had significant concerns about self-ID and I would uh, have had those significant concerns about self-ID. Would you have voted for the bill? And therefore, the bill in its current form, I would have struggled to vote for. You'd have opposed it? I would not have been able to vote for the principle of self-ID. You'd have had to resign? Well, obviously, that would have been a question of collective responsibility, and um, that would have been a decision that I'd have had to take in discussion with uh, colleagues. Do you think someone should be able to simply declare that they are a woman if they were born biologically male? I don't think self-identification is sufficient. But that's the heart of the bill, isn't it? It is. So that's my point. So it's not I just a little amendment. You're talking about a fundamental rewriting of this Well, there's bill. two parts to this. One is you've asked me what my view is on the current bill, and that's what I'm telling you in terms of self-ID. But in terms of where we go next, the commitment I would make is to engage in discussions with the UK government about the amendments that need to be made because this is a bill that was passed by three quarters by the Scottish uh, Parliament. So it's a, a bill that has been voted on um, by the Scottish Parliament. And I would want to understand what amendments need to be made to make that bill compatible. Do you think a man can marry another man? I do, under the legal provisions in this country. Uh, I am a servant of democracy in this country. Uh, equal marriage is a legal right and therefore uh, it, I would defend that legal commitment. Incidentally though, I would hope that others can defend the rights of other minorities, including religious minorities that might take a different view. What's your position on the morality of the issue? In terms of the morality of the issue, I am a practicing Christian. I practice the um, teachings of most mainstream religions, whether that's Islam, Judaism, Christianity, um, that marriage is between a man and a woman. But that's what I practice. As a servant of democracy, in a country where this is law, I would defend to the hilt your right and anybody else's right to live and to love without harassment or fear. Just finally, you are here in what should have been, not quite the middle, but during your maternity leave. I, I just wonder how you're feeling about that, how, how, how this whole thing has unfolded. I wonder if you could give me a sense of how much of a surprise this was for you and, the, if you don't mind, the personal oh. impact this has had. Well, I'm sure there are many mothers and fathers around the country that have feared the return to work after maternity leave. I certainly wasn't intending to go back for another few months and it's tough. I don't think there's any doubt that it's tough. And it's tough for the dads as well as the mothers. And I have a really incredible, remarkable husband who is currently looking after my little baby girl. And there are many other families that manage that as well. Um, and here's to the parents who have to juggle. Well, that's Kate Forbes, and we do hope to hear at length from the other candidate in this contest, Ash Reagan, later this week.